Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about common sources of programming frustration. This is probably probably going to be a long video. It's also me talking to programmers. So while it may be of interest to non-game development programmers, it's probably only academically interesting to any of the game development people who aren't programmers. Although I, there are some things in here I think some production people should look at. Or, I'm sorry, just be aware of. Because um, I got a couple production things to say at the end of the video. But let me also say that this is not going to be the same video as the one I did on challenges facing programmers in game development. That's more of a team related thing about, you know, the challenges of working with non-programmers. This is more of things that will happen when you're programming that will frustrate you, aggravate you, throw you into a rage, and pretty much sometimes put a roadblock in on development. I'm going to talk about what they are, the different ones that have happened, and something maybe give you some ideas of how you can ameliorate these. I don't think I can solve it, but I think I can help ameliorate it. So let's talk about a few things. First, let's talk about when you're using other people's source code. This could be a game engine. This could be a sound library. This could be the standard temp template library, you know, STL. Eventually, you're going to run into a method that doesn't work. I'm not talking about a bug method. I'm talking about something that is entirely unimplemented. And yet, in their documentation, there's it's implied that it's working. Now, I know this has happened with some of the modern game engines, and I'm sure you have stories about it. But this is not new. This happened back on Arcanum. We wanted to do some text processing in DirectX, and Ar Arcanum was 2D. The text processing functions existed. They worked in 3D. Many of the pages implied they worked in 2D, but then I found one that said, this is not implemented yet. It will be supported in a later revision of DirectX. I think it was aliasing text. I don't remember. I mean, this is 20 years ago and my note wasn't clear on this. Let me just tell you something. We worked on Arcanum for three years and that feature never got implemented in 2D DirectX. I finally got a hold of someone there who said it wasn't being prioritized because everybody's going 3D. So this is something we waited on for years that never that, that function never got working. So we eventually just did it ourselves. Or we used... I think we use drop shadows, so it still looked good against all the different backgrounds. So you have to be aware of that. You will sometimes use third-party software, and some of the methods they provide that they expose in their APIs do not work. I'm not talking they're bugged. I mean, they literally are unimplemented. So now let's talk about bugs. Not just your own, but also in third-party. I've already mentioned in the Fallout 2 video, by the way, I will reference all these videos below. In the Fallout, why I left Fallout 2, I talked about a memory overwrite, which was entirely caused by, you know, the internal programming team and how we spent two weeks looking for that, two very frustrating weeks. So I'm not going to repeat that here. What I am going to tell you about is another memory bug that we had early on. I think this happened about a year into development. No, it had to be more than a year um, because uh, Chris Jones helped fix it. So that would be a year and a half maybe a year and a half, not quite two years into it. It was this. The compiler we were using was called Watcom, and we were using it because it had this really cool flat mode that let you access more than 64K of memory at once, which me coming from Unix background, I thought was an archaic limitation on Windows that I could only grab at 64K blocks of memory. So anyway, Watcom lets you do a flat mode. Great. Full 32-bit pointers. Love it. We, had, we ran into a problem. We started noticing memory overwrites. And what was weird about them was we traced it into functions that were writing within the boundaries we set. So let's say we had a block of memory a thousand bytes long. We'd write 900 bytes into it. And then we get a memory overwrite in another block of memory in another piece of code. We finally traced it. And it was, it was a pain to do this. We noticed that the blocks that were complaining about being overwritten had all been realloc. In 
memory, you can malloc, which is create a block, free, which is release it, and realloc. Realloc says, I want to take that block of memory I have and make it a little bit longer. And if you can just add to the end, that's great. Otherwise, it has to find a new, bigger block and copy your old data to the, to the beginning of it. So then you have the extra memory at the end. We'd realloc re some blocks in Fallout, and these were the ones that were reporting the errors. So I sent an email to the Whatcom support email, and they wrote back, no, it's almost certainly a bug. And actually, no, I don't even think they said almost. They said, it's got to be a bug in your code. We know nothing about what you're talking about. This kind of made me mad because I thought it was pretty obvious from our code what the problem is. So I wrote a five-line program. The first two lines looped over and malloced a 1,000 blocks. The next three lines looped through those malloc blocks, would realloc them to bigger sizes, and then look to see if the realloc block conflicted with any of the other 999 already created blocks. And it just kept looping and looping forever until it finally saw one of them conflict, and then it printed an error message and stopped. Let me tell you something. You could run this program, and it would never run for more than 20 seconds before it would stop and go, this realloc realloc block includes part of a memory that was malloc for, for an earlier block of memory. I sent this back to support and I said, here's five lines of code. Either tell me where my bug is or admit that you have a bug in realloc. 48 hours later, to their credit, they said, we have a bug in realloc. It'll be fixed in the next revision. Now, two things I just want to make clear here. They probably get thousands of support messages where the error is on the programmer using the compiler. So they probably just thought I was another one of those programmers. So I get why I got the initial feedback. I was just a little, mm, this is wasting our time. But also, I'm going to talk later, Chris Jones went in and saved the day by we ended up writing our own memory allocation routines. And I'll talk about that at the end. It's part of how you can solve some of these frustrations. So the next thing I want to talk about is user interface. I find user interface code to be some of the most painful and frustrating code I've ever written throughout my career. It was a pain in the 80s, and I find it to be a pain in the 2020s. It's hard to exactly explain why, other than it seems to be an enormous, frustrating time sink with endless causes of bugs. Not just because of what I've already mentioned, which is sometimes there will be a method that isn't implemented or a method that doesn't work the way exactly they describe it will work. But for a third reason, which is among UI um, APIs, often if you want to do it exactly the way they describe it, it's easy. If you need a tiny change, like I need that button to be transparent or I need that button to be non-rectangular, oh my God, it is like extracting teeth it becomes the most painful change. And you can have an artist who's just like, but I thought we agreed a year ago that we would have round buttons. And you're like, uh. it It's something that changes the schedule to, I could have had this done in a day and now it's going to take me weeks. Take note, production people. Is this something you could have predicted? Mm, we'll talk about that later. Um, now let's talk about changes to design. Um, or just changes in general. Sometimes you will, the designers will write a design for something, system design, a UI design, narrative design, something. You'll code it up and then they change their mind. They haven't even run what you've done. In between when you coded it and it was being tested, they went, oh, we've had to change our mind. Now, that's really bad and annoying. It's like, did couldn't you have thought of this before? But let me tell you a second thing that happens too, which is they write a design Everybody looks at it and goes, that's good. You then code it, then it's being tested, and QA discovers issues with it. These aren't bugs. The code is a flawless recreation of the design. The design itself has a bug embedded in it. So now the design has to change. This isn't so bad. You shouldn't get so upset about it. It's, it's, it's not uncommon, but it's not super common. It happens is basically what I'm saying. So you, again, have to change your code. I'm sure a lot of programmers know where I'm getting at of this, why this is frustrating. Lots of changes to code tends to lead to what's called spaghetti code. When you wrote the code the first time, it was really well designed. But then, because the design changed, for better or for worse, you had to go in and change things. 
Then you had to go and change things again. And then there were bugs and you had to go and change things again. Now the code looks pretty bad. And at this point, you may have a lead who's getting mad at you. Like, why did you write such horrible code? And you're like, I didn't. My code was a flawless gem. And then things changed. Now, you could say, well, when you rewrite it, you should have made it flawless. Like, um, I'm often given like a day to fix this bug. I didn't have time to rewrite the entire section of code. So that will lead to frustrations for programmers, especially between programmers and productions. So now let me say why this is something I wanted production people to be aware of. All those sources I talked about, design changes, bugs in your code, bugs in third-party code, third-party code unimplemented but documented um, elements, user interface, just user interface across the board. These are things that lead to slowdowns in programming and then later on lead to crunch. And I'm a firm belief that there is no magic production wand that can foresee and fix all these things. I've already done two videos on crunch. Please watch them both if you think I either don't know what I'm talking about or can't come up with counterexamples, because I can. So what I'm saying is to production people and then to all the non-production people going, it's management's fault. No buffers of time, no fallback designs, nothing of this can account for all of these things that will happen. And even if you accounted for them, some of them are just unavoidable. They will happen. And you're thinking, well, we'll make buffers. You probably can't unless you make such a big buffer that you run into the other problem I'm talking about where it's so cautious that you come up with a design and they say, it will take two months to do this. You're like, you sure it won't take two days? Two months. Because you're trying to account for all those things that might happen and often won't. Like the Whatcom error. When Whatcom originally sent back, I was like, maybe they're right. Maybe it's our code. There are two other games here that use Whatcom and they're not running into this problem. Well, it was because it was in Realic and they were they were just malloking and freeing. They were grabbing blocks, using them and, fr and then letting them go. We realloc the block. That's where the error was. So that would not, that's not possible to foresee. Nobody could have gone, hey, I'm going to put up some buffer of time here in case your compiler is broken. And by the way, that's not as far-fetched as it sounds, I've often seen compilers broken on the optimization flags, where you, you have a perfectly running piece of code that's kind of slow, you turn on the compiler optimization, and now it runs really fast, and it's broken. Um, a whole bunch of different things that can happen there. I'm basically saying production can't account for all this. They literally cannot. So what is my solution? I have three different suggestions on what you can do when you run into these frustrating programming situations. And these are all for programmers to deal with. The first thing you can do is switch to something else for a while. Just jump to another piece of code, go home, go ride your bike, go do something else for a while. Just don't have eyes on this piece of code. You'll be surprised at how frequently you come back in a day or two, look at the code and immediately go, oh, there's the problem. This used to happen all the time when I was in engineering school. And some of my non-engineer, non-computer science engineering schoolmates would have a programming problem and they couldn't see it. It was like, I, it's a very simple Pascal program. And they're like, I don't understand. And then I'd look at it and go, oh, you're missing a semicolon at the end because you had to have a semicolon at the end of every uh, Pascal line. And they're like, ugh. And the reason the compiler didn't see it is those compilers were somewhat primitive. And with the lack of a semicolon meant they went to the next line and possibly the next few lines. And the, the next line happened to be a comment. And then two lines down, he finally had a semicolon. And so it grouped all those lines together, tried to process it into something, and then came up with some obscure, like, I don't know a method to call for this. And it's like, no, it's just you're missing a semicolon. It's hard to see. Sometimes, you know, just going away for a while. But it brings in my other point, which is sometimes bringing in another pair of eyes can massively help you out. Um, I'm not a big fan of pair programming, which is two programmers working on a piece of code to produce it, but I'm a huge fan of pair debugging, which is if you get stuck trying to figure out what the bug is in your code, sometimes bringing another programmer and saying, watch what happens when I step through this. Sometimes that other programmer will go, oh, something just stomped on your memory. Oh, 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 you are, this isn't the method you want to call because it's not, it doesn't check for capitalization in strings or something like that. Sometimes they just immediately see it. So if switching to something else or getting another programmer to look at it with you isn't something you can do, then sometimes you just have to rewrite it. And that's the third solution. Just rewrite the thing. But when you rewrite it, don't rewrite it the same way. Use a different algorithm. Use a different set of data structures. When we ran into that realloc problem 
from Wacom, and we did not know how long it was going to take them to get back to us. Chris Jones, the other lead programmer on Fallout, pointed out that we were also having fragmentation issues in DOS, where we were having, between all of our Malix and Freeze and Realix, we were having memory all over the place. And he suggested rewriting our memory allocation system to do two things. One, we malloced one giant block when the game started, and that's all we used. And we, all the malloc, realix, and freeze happen within that block, and they all happen through handles instead of pointers. A handle is a pointer that you have to say when you go to use it, I'm locking you, and then you get a pointer you can use. And then when you're done, you say, I'm unlocking you. The cool thing about that is at any point you can say, try to defragment memory, and any pointer that isn't locked, any block that isn't locked, can be moved around. And you can try to coalesce all your memory into one spot. And, and even if you have holes in memory, you can coalesce them into a big block that maybe can be used to get, give you memory. Chris did that even before, I think, Watcom fixed Realic. Not only did that avoid the Realic problem we were having with our compiler, but it saved the DOS version of Fallout, which was having massive fragmentation issues. I mentioned that, I think, in my Fallout timeline video. So... Here's what I want you to get out of this. There, are, If you're a programmer, whether you're in pro, uh, game development or a lot, you're going to run to a lot of these frustrating things. They just happen. I also think they're unavoidable. They're unforeseeable sometimes. Except maybe, oh, I've got UI. I'm going to quadruple my time estimate because UI always is a time sink. But for a lot of the other ones, you could double it or whatever, and you're still going to run into things you absolutely did not foresee. The only solutions I have is jump to something else, bring someone else in to help you debug it, or just rewrite it from scratch in a whole new way. These I've found, sometimes I could rewrite it faster than it would take me to debug it. So I'm hoping these are things that can help you and also for other people, make you understand why sometimes crunch happens, not because you have a bad team, but unforeseeable things can happen. It's game development. It's half art. It's not all science. So I hope this helps you programmers and production people.